Hey guys, thank you so much for being here for our third Untapped event. Um, last time it was a couple of days before GDPR. I'm happy to see we all survived to tell <laughs> what's going on. Uh, so short updates of Taptica. We're, um, we actually, we're growing. We um, published our latest um, H1 results and announced the growth of more than 100% in revenue, uh, which is awesome, but now we need to work hard to make sure that we're maintaining this. Um, part of the growth is definitely due to our latest acquisition of a Tremor Video DSP, a New York-based um, company, but also definitely from the organic point of view. Um, I can share with you that as we speak, many interesting things are happening behind the scenes, and um, I'll be hoping to share with you more concrete information in the near future. We really appreciate all of you um, being here, being part of our success. Um, and this night discussion is very is an interesting one. Post GDPR and everything that has a, has happened in 2018, and we're gonna discuss how personalization in advertising, when it's effective, when it's a bit creepy, and I think this time it's really on point because all of us, not only being part of the advertisement um, advertising industry. We're also users. Um, so we brought to you the top-notch speakers on, on, on that matter. So we're going to start with uh, Dina Burbitt from WCRS. We'll move on with Phil Palmer from Total Media and Elisa Bonick from Digital Cat Catapult. Um, so I'm going to take you through a day in dark data, roughly five minutes worth. So this is how data leaks from you during a day, basically. So let's start at midnight. You're sleeping. You've been there for a while. People like Apple and Google know where your home is. They've inferred that that's your home because you've been there for a while. Uh, maybe three o'clock, maybe a fox trips across your, your garden, trips the, uh, the IP camera that's been uploaded somewhere. Actually probably also being used to optimize the product as well. Seven o'clock, your alarm goes off, so you check your social media. Of course you do, there's a little spike goes on somewhere, right? You're now available to be marketed to. They know who you are already. Eight o'clock, you've done your thing. Uh, you leave, so you go past your Nest device, owned by Google, by the way, but they're not gonna share data just yet, but we know when you leave, um, so that's interesting. You walk to the shops, loads of apps on your phone are tracking you. You probably don't realize how many, um, and how many, so there's a few news apps that are probably tracking you right now. However, you're getting ads personalized. Uh, you tap onto the bus, so obviously TFL, whoever it is, know where you are, they know your journey. They're using that to actually optimize their service in the future. Uh, 8.15, you're stuck in traffic, so there were probably 32 people all doing the same speed as you, all checking their phones, that means you're on a bus, we know that. If you're doing 100 miles an hour, you're probably on a train. So we can identify what you're doing when you're doing it with how many other people. Uh, the bus goes past the billboards. We're looking at the API from TFL. Uh, we know when the bus goes by and we know there's a heavy traffic. So we can then have a billboard about that. That's dynamic. Of course, you log into the Wi-Fi on the tube. So unless you're using a VPN on the tube, which clearly nobody does, then everything you're doing is going through a public Wi-Fi, uh, unless you're using HTTPS, of course. But they're also using it to track your movement. There also is a lot of people in one place. They'll put adverts there in the future. Uh, obviously, you're playing Candy Crush at some point, so you've probably left your phone Wi-Fi open. And every one of your phones is probably called your first name and the type of phone you've got, so they know who you are. They've probably sent you an aubergine. Uh, just as you're getting off the, off the train, um, I've got an app on my phone that can read your credit card number, your contacts <coughs> details, how many pin tries you've got, the 10 latest transactions, uh, and your name, uh, all off your credit cards. I can do that just by touching your wallet, um, but without actually touching you, obviously. Uh, you arrive at work six minutes late, obviously, so you tap in. HR will use that if you're on a disciplinary, late, a disciplinary later, six minutes late. Uh, you grab a coffee, you've been there for a while, so we now know where you work. We've inferred where you work. If you are at university, we'll also infer that you actually go to school, because we know that's where you're at. Uh, so you're just working. All the apps on your computer are reporting back to Microsoft and Apple. So what you use, when you use, what features you use, what type of features you use, great. Uh, so you're emailing somebody, the email that you send to them, they're picking up on probably Yahoo Mail or Gmail, or probably more like a Yahoo these days. So everything that you've just sent them is being read by a computer and they're being marketing to because of that. Uh, you maybe do some photocopying. So every single sheet of a photocopy you do has some secret dots on it that reveal when, what photocopy ID that you use, and well actually if you've logged into it with a card, who actually photocopied it. You leave for lunch, bang on time obviously, HR now 60 seconds is running. So you're walking through the shops, your face is being detected, they know you've got glasses, so they've given you a, uh, a, a, an eye test ad. Uh, you go into the shops, they're using Hotstone Analytics maybe, they're looking at your shoes, they're tracking your shoes around. They tally that with the till data when you get there, they know exactly what somebody like you who wears brogues, clearly a bloke, not a child, uh, has bought. Um, so that's interesting, you pay for your checkout, so your banking connected bot on Facebook now knows what you're buying, thinks you spend <coughs> quite a lot, so probably suggest a cheaper place in the future. 
You probably use your loyalty card as well. Oracle get a bunch of loyalty card data. So that will be uh, attributed <coughs> up to whoever gave you the advert to buy whatever you just had, uh, bought. Uh, you go and meet your mate in the park, you sit together, you sit together every day. So the social media networks will know that if you sit together every day, that's probably your friend because that geodata is the same every day. They will infer that. Take a picture of your food, of course you do. Um, there'll be a machine learning algorithm that knows exactly what you've um, uh, taken a picture of. And you'll get more ads for that. Um, or so you can maybe search for something just on the open web, just go to a website. So your, your basically your header data of any website is sent across everything from your location, your IP, or you can infer your location from your IP, your phone type, your browser, lots of stuff go with every single request to a website. Therefore, when you go to the next website, you're getting retargeted with what you didn't check out because they've dropped a cookie on you. And you get back after an hour, if you made it, you swiped it back in. Um, so your friend says, yay, great to meet up at lunch. Obviously, I've mixed all the pictures. I couldn't get a whole person to do this. Um, <laughs> so they now know that your relationship is quite interesting. So if your relationship are all tagged everywhere, there's a huge network of tagged relationships they can then use. Um, so you sign up to a newsletter, maybe. Uh, there's a work newsletter going around. You think you signed it up. But unfortunately, it's overseas. So you're going to go into a great aggregated pool of data that's going to be sold and sold and sold. Uh, so you clock out of work. You nail the six minutes back. So that's OK. Um, so you're getting near home, so your phone has now told your thermostat to switch on. Uh, you put the kettle on, so a lot of energy, or some energy providers, are actually using what they call harmonics to detect what appliances you're using. So your kettle makes a different spike in your electricity than, for instance, your, your dishwasher. They know what you're using, and they know what appliances you've got. You turn on your TV, clearly all of your digital viewing habits are being recorded because you're pulling it from them. Uh, and then you use voice search. Um, one thing is your voice data goes over to somewhere else. They interrogate it there, and then they send you the results back. So that interrogation actually has all the background noise as well. So they can infer that you're at home, you're watching TV, if they wanted to. They don't, but they could do. Uh, then you go to bed. So you do your last social check, so they know you're now not on social anymore. Uh, all your devices in your house, everything you've connected to your routers, your internet of devices, whatever, they're all just constantly flicking on and off. So those are all communicating even when you're asleep and you're asleep again. So we know you're asleep because you're at home. So the point is, you know, eat, sleep, sleep, repeat. And that's what happens all the time. So I think it's unsustainable. Um, so we're currently at a sort of a, it's convenient, it's free, it's a bit leaky, very corporate, distributed, your data is everywhere. We're moving to a sort of more controlled, possibly funded, uh, a more secure, open and decentralized. You know, you'll hear blockchain come out quite a lot in these discussions. So I think we're moving to this place because it's unsustainable. And my last slide is really, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the modern internet. So you know, at his point, he's starting this thing called Solid, which gives you control over your data. Um, it's a new way of envisaging um, sort of uh, social media and also networks. So he's using the existing internet, and this is his thing. So users should have the freedom to choose where their data resides and who is allowed to access it. You have your data. You tell people um, who, who can get to use it because there's a benefit to it. And also you realize there's a value in it. So essentially the question I'm going to ask is, you know, is Tim Berners-Lee There you go. Thank you. My question is, how much freedom is too much freedom? Do you know what I mean? I mean, to some extent, like, you should be able to say, look, I'm going to give you access to X, Y, and Z. If too many people are saying, look, I want to have the freedom to choose what data I'm given, does it get to a point where, like, we don't have enough to kind of power what we do? I think maybe too much. Yeah. Too much option might be a bit too... Well, I, I think know, there's a question of, up, does know. what you think you need to do is that because you're in it and you think you need to do that right now? So, um, you know, the analogy I've got is, uh, I don't know, in, in the Victorian, well, I don't know, Tudor times, people put lead on their faces because they thought it was the right thing to do. Um, and if everybody would go, like, of course I need lead, and I need as much lead as I possibly can put on my yeah. face. And then people before it were going, why the hell are you doing that? And the people after it were like, why did you do that? And it was because you were in it, then it didn't seem abnormal to want the freedom that you've got to do whatever you wanted to do. That's but because they do know better. I know, exactly. So at the moment we're going, oh, I want the freedom to give the, as much data because I think the perceived reward is worth it. However, in 20 years' time, we'll look back and go, oh my word, we just had no idea. So then um, it's up to us to put limitations on the freedom that we have, right? Well, it's interesting what you think. It's freedom to give your data away to one person is to somebody else, which is like, stop stealing my data you know, because that's yeah. not freedom. I want the freedom to keep my data. So that's the discussion is one person's freedom. You know, if you see a benefit, great. If you see the nefarious evil that could happen, then you, there's no way to stop it currently. Yeah. I think for someone like us, like, 
if we put limitations to people's freedom, then it limits what we can do in terms of like from a marketeer's point of view, right? Yeah, but that's the question is like, that's from your point of view. Uh, <laughs> and me, as a, you know, I work for an advertising agency as well. Yeah. Um, so it's great what I want to do, but yeah, yeah. you know, all I got to do is go up and see my, my farming background up in the up in Worcestershire, and they go, they have no flying clue what I do, and they don't care either. Yeah. You know, they're basically just throwing stones into a pond on Saturday because that's fun. Yeah. So what we think is what we should be able to do is what other people probably don't want. What do you find as misuse of data? Misuse, sorry. What do you define as misuse of data? Um. It's difficult because I think with GDPR at the moment, it's, I think when you get that little cookie thing, I think we go, yeah, well, GDPR has really solved everything. And now we're just wading through, do you access these cookies? And then you realise there's a billion cookies and they're all doing stuff you've never been told before. And I think we're just having our, our eyes open to exactly what everybody's doing. They're all having a little nibble at us. So I'm, I'm re relatively, I think misuse of data for me personally, you know, as a dad of two and a you know, husband and all that sort of stuff, I think it's just when you are unaware of your data being used for something. I think it's as broad as that for me. So yeah, That is very broad. So that is mm -hmm. at the very broad end of it. Yeah. I can see what that argument is. That is well, another, okay, no, another misuse of data that we would get involved in, it, well, we don't get involved in misuses of data, but the, the, where we get to the, the rub is, say, outdoor advertising. <coughs> so we've done a few things recently where um, we've had a billboard for domestic violence and um, if there's a lady with a bruised face on the, on the billboard, and if you just walk by it, nothing will change, the bruises won't go. If you stop and look at the billboard, then the bruises will start to disappear. I.e., if you walk past domestic violence, and nothing will change. If you pay attention to it, you can make a difference. Um, that's a good use of essentially ambient data, your face, all that sort of stuff. Um, if we then said, which we can do, hey, white guy with a beard, don't walk by for the third time, which we, we can totally do all of this. Um, so I think it's when there's, there's this middle ground that we get involved in, which is when is it just creepy? You shouldn't be doing that, even though you can do it. Even the message that we tell on the billboard. But some, like you said, some people find even retargeting quite creepy. Mm. And yeah. the idea of someone knowing what was in my basket. Yeah. So I think how do you, and you, you're talking about centralising a lot of that decision, uh, having some sort of regulation, but it, surely that will be influenced by people's personal opinions on what misuse of data is. So you talk also talk about 20 years' time. Yeah. So what may be a scarier is what will happen in 20 years' time. Do we trust our governments with use of data? <coughs> For me, that's where misuse of data comes in. It's, it's the people really in power, not what I'm advertised to. Yeah, I just don't, I don't think we've got the, the tools to make the decisions. Like, we have not been brought up to have the conversations about data. So they, when I talked about Brexit, for instance, with my family up north, they literally on a complete different planet. They just did not have access to the data. They didn't realise they were they were getting messages sent to them, and their Cambridge Analytica were popping up all the time. There we go, sorry, that's going to work. Um, you're going to get a screensaver. Um, <laughs> so I think that's one of the problems for me. Is it's you know it's it's not widely distributed this knowledge about how much you're being used or not. So there's certain people who are walking around with an opinion. They're quite frank. I had a big sort of well, I wasn't a bust up. But I had a really a good moment with my daughter where. Like, Dad, how, how do you re not realise that this is the most important video right now on YouTube? And I go, because it's not, because mine's got a motorbike on it. And he goes, well, mine's got this. Yeah, like, you do realise you're getting completely different data. So if you have an argument at school when you say, it's number one, again, no, it's number one, you're being fed different data. And I don't think, she didn't know. So it's like a birds and the bees chat that we need to have at school. That, you know, they need to realise that they're on their own little Tower of Babel. And what they think is true is possibly not. So I think that's when misuse of data for me is when you just don't know it's happening to you. So I come back to the same broad, I think it's, you know, I think we, we can't be too specific and for one person it's great. Great, well Tim Berners-Lee says if it's if for you, you want to be tracked and, you know, we did a bit of research recently with younger, you know, the low 24 year olds and they were saying we want to have sites, we will visit sites more if we know that it predict what we want. If it doesn't, it's a dumb site, we don't want to go there. Like, okay, that's interesting. If you talk to over 50s, they went, I want nothing to do with that sort of site. So you'll never get any agreement on it. So I think somebody's got to take control of it uh, and make a decision for everyone. Well, not everyone. If you want to opt in, it's your decision. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right, hello. That is me, I promise. <laughs> 
slightly <coughs> outdated. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so that was me before I had kids, by the way. That's <laughs> basically the age, it's only a couple of years as well. Terrifying. Um, so we've probably just about got the answer for all of those questions, ultimately. A, I wish my clients had a third of that data. That'd be fantastic. I could do so much more work if I knew what time people were waking up and what time they weren't. That would be so tough. But if you want to try and get away from the overall creepy vibe that exists out there, the best way to do it is just to start to aggregate that data into things that aren't personally identifiable. So I can't say, hey, you at the back. Uh, I know you like, I don't know, let's say very, and I also know you like ASOS. Actually, you're just one of three or four people in the room that actually like that. And the way that we start to do that is basically looking at people's personas, ultimately, that sits within it. And the only way that as a marketeer, you can actually start to influence what people think and the way they behave is to just treat them like people, ultimately. Stop treating them like they're an audience member, they're a customer. Treat them like a regular person. Have a look at what it is that they care about and then start to create empathy. And the way you create empathy with somebody is that you're relevant to what they care about and you're there at the right time and you're the right person to actually have that conversation with them. Uh, and that's the way that we do it, ultimately. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, <laughs> on Ruth's point, everything is GDPR friendly because there's nothing personally identifiable that sits within it. Uh, anybody here that works in a media agency, it proves your media effectiveness, which is great. Anybody here from a creative agency? Woo. Perfect. <laughs> uh, it helps <laughs> the one single person. Minus Dina. Uh, it helps with your creative as well because ultimately you can start to think about personalities and personas and how you can actually start to deliver something to them which actually feels authentic and genuine that sits within it. So very briefly I'll take you through three bits. So why you do it, how we do it, and then ultimately how you actually then start to use personas within it. So if you take this handsome gentleman here, which mm -hmm. judging by my current aging rate from that first picture to now, would probably be in about five years, is 69 male, married, two plus kids, Estimated wealth, 100 million. If you're going to go down like basic socio demographic <laughs> type stuff, it's pretty well off ultimately. If you're one of your clients, you're probably a quite happy client ultimately. Problem being that you don't really know if he's Prince Charles or the Prince of Darkness, Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> and that hits you with a fundamental problem that do you talk to him as Prince Charles or as Ozzy Osbourne? Because they're going to have very different backgrounds, very different upbringings, very different outlooks of life. And it's all about trying to understand which is which. And you can start to do that from analyzing people's personas. Uh, there is proof, it's not just us that just make this stuff up. Um, there's lots of academic research that goes into it. Um, a lot of it comes out of MIT and IBM ultimately, but people actually start to resonate more with things that sound familiar to them. We call it, uh, within the work that we do, the mirroring effect ultimately. Um, which actually sits on the slide as well. Look, look, visualization, you see that? Guy looking at guy, mirroring effect. And the reason why you do that for is because you look for things that are familiar in other people. You're quite literally lean into conversations that you find interesting. We have <coughs> something in our brain called the mirror neuron, which is when you're young, how you learn how to behave. So for example, if you've got small nieces, nephews, cousins, that kind of stuff, when they fall over, they'll look around to an adult to work out whether or not they should cry or they should laugh. And whatever it is that you do to them is the, basically the behavior that they'll learn from the back of it. And you can do that with messaging and with marketing ultimately. So the how we do it. Um, you will start off with something that's called psycholinguistics, ultimately. So you're going to find lots and lots of text from somebody. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. So social media forums, you can take call centers, videos, news and reviews, and you can start to aggregate it through what we call the empathy engine, which ultimately gives you some different outputs that sit in the back of it. So you'll find out what's somebody's persona, and I'll take you through a persona in a second so you get a feel for actually what it is that you can get as information. Who influences them or what influences them? the emotions that sit around different topics of conversation, which is how you realize what it is that they actually care about. And that's what you can start to do to create that empathy. Values and needs, ultimately. So what it is they value? Do they care about other people? Do they care about themselves? Do they care about having structure? Do they not? All these types of things you can actually start to work out from the language that people use, the semantic structure, the types of text, the way that they start to structure their arguments and the conversations they're having. So if you're going to take a persona, anybody here study psychology at some point? A room full of people in marketing will never be studying psychology. <laughs> impressive, impressive. I didn't myself either, so I can't really lie. Um, basically, you've got five core things which make up anybody's personality. It's going to go right now and say that personalities are fluid things. You'll change your personalities and your modules during the day, depending on who you are, who you're talking to, what mode you're in, if you're at work, if you're at home, if you're on the street. And what you'll do is you'll start to change the way you interact with the world. 
but they still are based on these five key points, which is called the ocean model. Ocean model because O C E A N. Openness, which is how open you are to uh, new experiences, how willing you are to explore things. Conscientiousness, which is basically how traditional you are, so how much you like routine, how much you like organisation. Extroversion, extroversion, I think it's good for that one. Agreeableness, how much you like to talk to other people and how much you're willing to give to those types of relationships. And then neuroticism, which they've renamed to being your emotional range because nobody likes to be called neurotic anymore. <laughs> but it's basically how sensitive <coughs> you are to new environments, to starting new relationships, how much you worry, all sit within it. So what you start to do is put this together. Uh, I did Gino, <laughs> which is a different shirt. shirt. Yeah. Different shirt, but the same <laughs> idea. So um, obviously we picked somebody that everybody's familiar with at the moment. So I'll take that away if you do. There you go. So this is Dina's profile, and basically what you've got. That's it. We checked by the way before I did this. Dina's okay. <laughs> and we can do this, um, and it's basically we've taken it from his Twitter feed, which obviously is a mix of work and personal to sit within it. You can see around the edges, this is your ocean profile, and then the subsets that start to fit within it. So openness is made of things like how adventurous you are, imagination, uh, intellect, authority challenging. I'll go through in a sec, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> all your conscientiousness is how self-disciplined you are, how much you like that routine, like I was saying, extroversion, cheerful, outgoing, gregariousness, agreeableness, altruistic, modest, sympathetic, trust, all of the nice qualities, neuroticism, uh, prone to worry, melancholy, so just how generally kind of insular you are, um, susceptible to stress, all the things that you'll think within it. And then the way that we start to apply this is then start to think about if that is your person, ultimately, and that is your persona that you're currently in, so on Twitter, Medina, for example, you've got to reflect a lot of what you do from a work point of view, which is creative, innovation, so new things. And what you'll start to see is there is zero conscientiousness in there, because obviously if you're talking about things that are new, you're not basing yourself in tradition because that is ultimately a jarring experience. But what you are is because you're creative. Intellect, obviously, because you work in media. We're all intellectual. <laughs> Authority challenging, because you're creative, edgy, going with new tech, new experiences, trying to push back against a lot of the normality that sits there, a lot of the prejudices, and naturally imagination from a creativity point of view. But broody artist, melancholy, self-consciousness, it, it can never have no self-doubt, ultimately. And we do this for a lot of our clients across a broad range. And you start to find different audiences start to resonate with different brands, different ideas, different industries that comes within it. So final bit, how we do it. Um, so if we go back to old bloke at the top, which is sadly one of our clients, uh, what you can start to do then is you'll take the overall vibe. So you notice it's a very different person. This is what you class as a high net worth individual, for example. So somebody owns over £300,000 a year as a base salary. And then what you can start to do is look at where they start to over-index, so assertive, active, self-efficacy. What they don't do is self-consciousness because if you are a high net worth individual, you don't want to show that you've got any vulnerability, which is obviously the next one that starts to come into it. And then you start to get a feel for what they're going to do. Active, outgoing, you're outdoors, <coughs> you're going to be doing the gym, you're going to be in different places. You start to think about what's your media placement that sits on top of it. Um, and then what you can start to do is they look at the values. So because of the fact that high intellect, high achievement striving, they want change ultimately and they want to challenge but you start to look at the high conscientiousness that sits within it and at that point then you're thinking they want practicality as well so they want something that's going to change the way they think but they want to deliver it in a format that feels regular and familiar to them because obviously they're short in time because they've got a lot going on as they're sitting there making their stacks and stacks of cash um, and then you start to uh, cluster it so these are all of the different audience types that sit within that client and every single one, we've basically got a bespoke message for. So we can talk to them in a different way at a different time and actually start to create that personalization without really having anything that's personally identifiable about that person themselves. Uh, you can do it for brands. So if you've got a client at the moment, this is one of ours, Fred Olson. Um, every client thinks they're a special snowflake and they're individual and they have their own unique way of talking. Every single client that we've ever done this for, you can do it on a brand level. I think they stand for something different. They do not. So this is Fred Olsen that sounds exactly the same as Piano Cruises, that sounds exactly the same as Royal Caribbean in the way that they talk about themselves and their products. <coughs> and fundamentally, then you can go in either at a creative level or a media level and say that actually you're not any different or at least you're not presenting yourself to your audience in any different way to what everybody else is doing. So you need to change it. Uh, what the other way that you can start to do for the creative people in the room is do it on different attributes. So that is all written text 
but you can also start to do it on words and voice to our conversation that we're having earlier, is that you can then categorize what people think a voice sounds like by doing lots of surveys, and then start to match it back to core attributes to sit within it. So you, for example, this is uh, a Slack. Oh yeah, he's a client, I should probably remove that. Um, this is Slack as a tone of voice. They want to be positive, pleasant, honest, innovative, pioneering. And what we do then is we match that back to basically the root of all of those words. It's a big bucket. And we start to profile the people that are sit with a voiceover for ads. Or you can pick audio tracks that sit on a label, which is where a lot of this text started from. And actually find the person that sounds and resonates most like your brand. So you can do it from radio, out of home. You can do it in store on the cruise line for Fred Olsen, which is definitely not what we're selling at the moment. So it's basically got a broad swathe of things that sit there. So you can put it into strategy, so you can start to create segments around it. Put it into creative, to actually have that authentic look and feel. Put it into insight, to actually understand what is it these people like and care about. And you can actually buy against it. So Nielsen um, and Visual DNA, you can actually start to buy on these characteristic traits. And TGI have also profiled media types against personality. So it's something that's definitely changed at the moment. And that is it. myself in the foot, but it feels like we're not able to catch up with the targeting capabilities from a media and a perspective. So some of these things that they're putting out, such as their relaxed person or mm -hmm. um, the you know, chilled out kind of character, how do you then translate that to a targeting perspective from a media point of view? Uh, I'd love to be able to find people who I think are fitting into that category, but actually it feels like the capabilities aren't there. Uh, without going into a really intricate, detailed um, point of view, which you can't do from a PPI point of view. <laughs> <laughs> so you've basically got two approaches to do that. The first one is the creative. So if you can create a piece of copy, text, imagery that resonates with it, then you can start to split test ultimately and have a look within that audience segment that you're buying against, so whatever it is, DBM that you're pushing it into or whatever ad server you start to use for it. What is it that actually resonates best? So what am I seeing my click-throughs? What are my kind of engagements? And then from that, you can start to then play around with going after different groups or then obviously start to optimize them towards it. Or B, you go with some of the people that can buy against it. So TGI will give you some rough insights in terms of media consumption based on personalities. And then Nielsen are doing a lot of custom survey work that sit behind it. So they can then profile and build out segments that sit within visual DNA. So you can buy it through that as well. Or, you do, well, I guess there's three options rather than two. The uh, third one is you start to create custom rule sets that sit within it. So if you take that as a broad insight in terms of extroversion, relaxed person, what it is, then you can start to say, from a behavioral point of view, kind of pull it on some Medina stuff, what is it that they're actually going to have within their life? And what are they going to be doing between this hour and this hour? They're probably going to be sat potentially at home, they might be out with friends, they might be eating, they probably won't be at the gym, they probably won't be working late. So what is it within their life journey that they're actually going to be doing at that point? And then start to, again, put your media towards it, and then test and learn. It's pretty much the only way. So like I said, there are not many people that are set up to do it, um, which is the fun part of it, ultimately, because it's something that's new. Thank you. Anybody else? Cool. Just, add to, just add to that last point, I used to work for a gaming company um, and we used to test about five or six hundred icons to find out what the best icon was before we actually launched a game. So we would literally just run ads for icons that linked nowhere, there was literally a 404 page, you could click them. And we just looked at the data constantly until we found it was a person leaning in from the left with a red bit on the top bit. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. We ended up with a big A-B test that came down to A. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Cool, thanks. Thank Amazing. you, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, my bit is probably going to be a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of data and, um, and kind of what to do with it. And I think I kind of hopefully complete the triangle of presentations by uh, being from an organization that's looking at uh, solutions, basically, and how to grow business through the use of data. Um, so I'm from an organization called Digital Catapult. I was going to give you a bit of a brief on what we do first before I go on to talk a little bit about, more about how we work with data. Um, so Digital Catapult, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of us, probably not. Um, we are only four years old, but we are not for profit. Um, we are established uh, primarily by the government in the UK, but we are here to grow the ecosystem uh, of business through the adoption of uh, advanced digital technologies. So. Um, 
basically there we go. Uh, so accelerating the adoption of uh, advanced digital tech. We have a bit of a unique place. We sit kind of across uh, a whole range of different stakeholders. Um, so we work with everybody from research and academia to corporates or industry uh, to start uh, startups as well as um, venture capitalists. So the idea is that we sit here and look at how those technologies can help support all of these different players in order to kind of um, grow the UK's economy. So we work across three different technology strands, um, and I think that most of you obviously understand that these are kind of the ones that are emerging as part of the UK's modern industrial strategy of how the world will operate going forward, so artificial intelligence, hence the data. Uh, future networks, which is all about 5G and the next level of connectivity, and that will be uh, really important for enabling both artificial intelligence and immersive experiences, which I'm sure many of you uh, are kind of heard of or kind of uh, kind of leaned into uh, in terms of connecting with customers and audiences. <laughs> I didn't realize it did that. Um, so we also work across, I will, I think this one does, uh, two different, yeah, there we go, uh, sectors um, that we look to apply those technologies to, um, creative industries, I'm head of creative industries, so I'm looking at how those technologies can help grow nine different sectors. Uh, within that, everything from uh, film and television to gaming to um, music to architecture. Um, and then manufacturing, digital manufacturing. So looking at how will we create things in the future and how will we use some of these new technologies in order to be able to kind of you know, sustain growth. Uh, new economy. So getting on to well, data, I guess, and artificial intelligence. Um, just a statement here, obviously, about uh, you know, there's obviously a bit of a buzz term around AI and how we use data. Um, and there's everything from the spectrum of the established ways, which is kind of data filtering and kind of analyzing, as we've been talking about, but also the emerging uh, use of data, which is everything from image recognition to voice recognition, as we've kind of seen with Amazon and everything that kind of launched around voice. So, you know, that's that broad spectrum. I think when people say, oh, I want to get into AI or I want an AI strategy, what is that exactly? And what part of the spectrum are you on? And I think we are there to help figure, help businesses figure out which, which part of the spectrum they sit on. So this is something we actively talk about at work a lot, which I'm uh, giving my head around. But it's basically, if you want to play in this space, what you have to be aware of in terms of uh, you know, actually using data and understanding how your business can grow. So there's obviously, at the bottom of the hierarchy of needs, uh, AI, uh, or data science hierarchy of needs, is how do you collect your data? So you know, do you have systems in place where you're actually gathering most of this, which is what we've been talking about? How do you move it from one place to the next? So that's you know from the point of collection to getting it into systems that you can actually effectively use it. Um, how do you clean that data? There's usually lots of holes in data, so how do you, and I think this is a kind of overlooked uh, part of the actual process of, you know, you can't just plug data in and expect it to actually work. You need to ensure that you're connecting all the dots along that way. So there's a lot of actually companies and uh, work being done in this area. How do you tag it and ensure that you're kind of writing the right formulas in order to then uh, you know, test and actually run the systems that you need to. So I think it's just ensuring when we go into businesses and many of the, you know, most of the time it is larger kind of manufacturing businesses that are kind of going, you know, they, they kind of sit around here and not realizing that they don't have actually most of the bits and pieces to, to get here. But, you know, they, this is the kind of really interesting bit, but actually there's a lot of work to be done to actually get to that point. So I just wanted to kind of bring up, um, if you're, you know, when we work with these businesses, what we're trying to get on their radar as well, that is the kind of hierarchy of data science, is thinking about, as a brand, what are you doing with your data? And I think this is some of the conversation we've been having. So I thought I'd just highlight four, and there's another fifth point coming up. But, um, so is your content trustworthy? And I think this is actually about, you know, when brands are pushing content out, there's a lot of, I think it's now just coming to fruition. You, know, you went through a lot of this kind of artificial intelligence and just um, pushing out content is where does your content sit? Where does it appear? Who is it next to? And that very much builds the brand image. Okay, it's really interesting content, but actually look at the bigger picture and the spectrum of where it's appearing. I think that's a really important thing to think about. Um, is your audience who you say it is? I think, um, and you might have a view on this, but there, 
you know, it's how do we ensure as brands or business um, that you are actually getting to the audiences that people tell you you're reaching? And you know, there's a lot of fake accounts out there. There's a lot of chatbots now. There's a lot of different ways, and are you actually reaching those audiences? So I think that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Are you taking proper care of your data? I think that's something we've been talking about as well. But um, you know, ensuring that obviously wherever you're gathering this data, that you have uh, you know protection and that customers understand that you know by giving you their data, they might not actually consent to that. It depends on obviously if they opt in. That they're um, that you've got those you know that in place in order for it to be sustainable for the long term. And also, how are you measuring where this data or where this kind of you know is landing. So I think that there's a lot of hype around, oh yeah, you know, you're reaching X amount of eyeballs or you're but actually what how is that translating into growing your business and how is that translating to return on investment? I think this is another really interesting area because I came before I worked at the catapult there was this um what was it the ballet for about four years, but before that, um the English National Ballet I was at Sky for ten years and I worked in their um corporate social responsibility team. And I think you know, there were many different facets of why, you know, a company or how we kind of um, positioned ourselves in terms of social good. And I think one that is emerging uh, is very much, um, you know, trust and whether or not your company can actually uh, cut through. And I think that trust will start to be a differentiator, will start to become a USP in the way that, um, you know, they have relationships with their customers. So I think it's how do you use your data, we've been talking about, to ensure that you're actually you know, making society better, not just trying to push out your own priority list. So, kind of talking about some of those key issues, this is just an example of some of the things that we do at the Catapult in order to be able to address some of these challenges. And so, the idea is that we have a kind of, a very, the, the, that idea of social good and neutral position as a not-for-profit, trying to suggest solutions to work with businesses in order to be able to address and play in this space. So we've started to kind of look at things like personal data receipts. So when you log into our offices, um, there's consent there to give you, you know, to, um, for, for us to be able to collect your email address, but also the idea that at some point you would have a, like a living, breathing receipt that would tell you exactly where, where your data has been, and that would be your logbook, and that you could, in any moment in time, uh, enter that to be able to amend or choose where data lives. So that you understand, because at the moment, I mean, I'm not sure if any of you would absolutely know who's got your data. Probably not from what you've been talking about. Content personalization networks. This is actually where we start to use blockchain a little bit more. But the idea is that you know there's a lot of chat around fake news and who's getting data from where and whether or not that data is authentic. And this is something that we're working on with um, across Europe actually with a couple of key media players where. Um, they start to tag uh, where news sources are coming from so that um, they are pushing at things they know are actually authentic and they're coming from a place where uh, you know, they, they can be assured that there's some trust there with audiences. Um, we run an accelerator program called Machine Intelligence Garage, which is basically to be able to take um, startups in the, uh, in the kind of data science AI space and uh, basically allow them mentoring and funding and uh, matchmaking with um, investors, but at the same time discuss things like ethics and how are they using data and how are we going to ensure that we kind of, you know, have a future uh, sustainable, uh, you know, business around some of these um, uh, data and, and how we use it. And then MI Sprints is um, basically to work directly with industry so that we can kind of take them through a three to eight month process where they come to us with a business challenge and we can actually say, right, are you at the bottom of the um, data science uh, hierarchy of needs, you at the top, where do you sit here and how do we actually ensure that over a certain period of time that your business internally as well as externally, can, we can take you through that journey. And we have in-house technologists which can build things as well so we have proof of concepts and prototypes that we can actually uh, make happen. So sometimes when we build things, people can kind of go, right, now I've got the evidence, I can go back to the business and say, we're doing this in the right way. And that's it, really. So as much as it's probably a bit more than nuts in the bolts, a um, bit of a whistle stop tour of what we do. If anybody is interested from your kind of own, own brands and businesses, come and chat to us. We have lots of events and lots of uh, leadership reports that we put out as well. And so we're, we are here to help build that ecosystem and, and educate people along the journey. So. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody has any questions.
question, guys. Yeah. Okay, so with AI, it's been going on. It's it's been going on for quite a while right now. Yeah. Like since Siri came out and everything, but I wonder how it's gonna play up when AR comes to life. Yeah. Because I know that Apple is working on a product right now for at least in like 2020 yeah. for like an AR and VR um, augmented reality service. Yeah. I just want to know how that's all going to play out together. Yeah. Well, all comes up. It's, um, it's interesting you mentioned that because um, I'm only kind of a, about three months in the world, but I, I think that. So I've been trying to get my head around the strategy, especially for a lot of these technologies mm -hmm. with the creative industries and how they're all going to... And I think one of the, the, the kind of strength points of it all is how 5G, AI, and immersive work together as yeah. a stack to enable some of these things to happen. Yeah. And I think that that's where some of the real kind of forward-thinking, vision-making pieces. So one thing we've been talking about as an example is in advertising, uh, as you will well know, you have, um, if you're kind of launching the campaign and you <laughs> create all of that content, um, you start off by, you know, obviously the photo shoot, um, and if you walk through the process from the photo shoot to actually releasing that material, it can be up to a six month process where there's a lot of gatekeepers involved and there's a lot of, um, you know, artistic directors and, and kind of uh, middle people placing the media and content at certain places. And, there's a lot of sign-off processes, and then you have to, you have your kind of traditional distribution channels where that gets. If you imagine where you can kind of capture those assets in a volumetric capture studio, so that's kind of more the immersive strand, and those assets are pieces, little pieces of content. So everything is quite digital, and you plug it into a process where you have a whole range of data about how to rearrange those pieces, and everything is you know it's, instead of just capturing one image, that image is broken down into like a thousand different components. You plug it into a, an algorithm machine where you've got loads of kind of understanding of how audiences. So if I'm an outdoor media and I'm walking by something and mm -hmm. it's kind of doing all the things that you were just talking about earlier, that all of a sudden you will have something will be engineered towards you in a completely immersive and you know, you might be you might have left your phone on to be open to receiving any of this. But that basically that process gets rewritten instantaneously through the capabilities of 5G, which is the next level of connectivity, and also through the understanding of your data in a completely different way. So you'll be walking through this world and being talked to and communicated with completely differently than having to stare at the screen or a tablet. Or, and I think that's where things get really interesting, really debatable, <laughs> hmm. um, but quite exciting. So, But, I mean, what I was talking about is the actual future. Yeah. As in, like, in two years' time, Everyone's going to have like an AR headset or a VR headset because mm. Apple's going to bring one out and then it's going to be mainstream. Mm. I've got, like, got a vision on this one. Yeah. So, um, so if you, if you, like two years won't happen. Mm -hmm. It might be, but we won't be, wor we won't be wearing five. them. I think if you go 50 years time, then um, if you take, you're, you're, there's a guy 20 years ago who got made blind, well not made blind, he was blind in both eyes through two accidents. So a doctor said, um, I reckon I can fiddle around with your optical cortex and get enough kind of, basically if I fiddle around with it, you'll go, oh Christ, there's a big piece of light just to happen in my wherever. You'll go, right, I'll do that enough and I can get reliably some balls of light to happen in your brain, which you think are, thought, are sight. So it went great. So he put a camera on the side of his head and this guy could then, completely blind, just having the camera going into his optical cortex, into a little sort of array of electrodes onto his brain, could then drive a car. Had, you know, white lines down the side of the road, but he could drive a car. So if you then, they've done, you know, a huge amount of research on that. So if you then take that forward 50 years and you have augmented eyeballs powered by 5G data, for instance, so you'll go into the armed forces and they'll go, well, you've got two organic eyeballs, they're pointless. Why don't you keep one for a backup and we'll give you the, you know, night vision, friend or foe enabled, augmented eyeball that's powered wirelessly, yeah. clearly. And therefore, what you think is your vision is really just plugging straight. You don't even need an eye, to be fair. You just need something plugged into your optical cortex. So if you want a, an eye because it looks nice, then great. But really, you just need something plugged into your optical cortex. And you've got two options. One is you can augment your vision at that point. Another one is you can just be your vision because you you've not got technical eyes anymore. You don't need them. So then you think, OK, something like Spotify. We go, well, I can't afford this new eye. And you go, well, Spotify will come up and say, right, if you have our eye, we'll give you it as a discount rate, as long as just before you fall asleep, 
we'll give you an ad for whatever. <laughs> and that will then, we'll give you it just when you hit REM sleep, because clearly we're plugged into everything that's going on in your body. And therefore, we know what you'll dream about for the first three minutes of your sleep, which will be our product. So, you know, if you want a, a vision of where augmented reality can go, then wearing a headset is like, you know, a square with a battery that you, you look through your eyes. It's like, dude, you know, it's like, that's going to be like so old fashioned you know, in 50 years time. So we're, we're obsessing about squares at the moment that will just be, you know, because we can give you cochlear implants, we can give you smell back, we can give you taste back. We can make you taste salt with a special spoon and you know all sorts of stuff so i think the body is really where the next ad sort of target is really so i think yeah. squares and stuff is is, is kind of is interesting I mean, that was just my thought. Yeah. yeah i mean i think that just to build on that there's two things that i've seen where and i've been talking a lot to kind of companies in that developing that immersive experiences you know, instead of having tablets you'll be just throwing things up into space and that will be it will all be designed around you to be able to interact with them and there's also something else i saw about contact lenses that you wear that basically help you <laughs> put them in your head and you kind of you know through that augmented reality experience you're analyzing yeah, that's constantly. the future exactly <laughs> well it, it, literally like it's being talked about it's out there five. So. <laughs> you're all going to be wearing so we <laughs> Don't think it's too weird now. Trust I don't know how people are going to. Well, <laughs> we won't have to drive because yeah, we'll be driverless cars. Literally, yeah. Literally, yeah. 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 I rewatched it. Oh uh, or another episode of Black Mirror. Oh, from the speakers, I'm interested to gauge. So we've been talking about all of these things. I'm interested to gauge whether or not you think it's uh, sort of linking back to the original topic of 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 obviously tonight. If that is actually creepy, or if it's you know convenient, if we can see things and and be able to plug things into our body and be able to target people specifically, is it is it creepy? And I want to sort of get your personal opinions on that. Well, you go first. Personally, no. Hey. I agree. <laughs> with, I think you need a value exchange in everything that you do. If you make it worth my time, I will give you all of my data. I will let you record my heartbeat. I'll let you have access to my bank statements. I will give you pretty much whatever it is, as long as what you're going to give me back in return makes it worth my time. You tell me I'm going to have a stroke, I will absolutely give you all my health and my heart rate monitor that sits in there. And if you're going to call like the ambulance just before I have my stroke, even better, I will probably take you to that service. I think. You need to have something that is worth the time. And to do that, you ultimately need to have an honest conversation about it with the right people. And if you can actually have that conversation and say, what is it that you genuinely want and what can we offer you? And providing their in life or in balance, then absolutely not creep or so. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm the diplomat, I'm always, I kind of figure that this is the way the world is evolving, and I sit in a role at the moment where I'm trying to make this work in a socially responsible way. So I think my view is there's a happy balance somewhere. It might take us a few bad tries to get it right, but I think the other thing that it, it's, it's important to recognize is that audiences, especially younger generations, are demanding more personalized you know, very customized, high-end experiences. How are, we, how are we going to get that without data? I don't know. So, you know, you, you, I'm not sure you can have it all. So I, I, my view is there is a middle ground, and it's just trying to find out where that is. Yeah, I'd sort of I'd broadly agree. Um, I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm way out there with what you can do with tech as well, and a lot of people are as well. But um, I've seen some really creepy stuff um, in the future. Um, so, you know, I know that MIT can see around corners, you know, they can use a camera, you know, 100 miles away and they can record the vibrations of a leaf in a room and infer the, the speech that was going on in that room. So, you know, there's an AI that was taught how to lip read, for instance, you know, you should just put like mouth movements and the words that went with them and eventually it goes, yeah, I got this, I got lip reading and therefore you know, there are, there's, there's a couple of, um, of companies, well, I can't say who they are yet, but um, there's a couple of companies that are using that in out-of-home media so that they just go, we know what everybody's talking about because we can just read everybody's, so, you know, when they're coming up. And we, you know, it's not science fiction. We do use billboards that have, um, you know, QVD run a system in most, bill or in a lot of billboards in the UK, digital billboards that have, you know, face recognition. They can recognise whether you're male or female, uh, they recognise your emotion, they know whether you've got glasses, beard, 
they know you know your age they'll have a good go at that as well so I think to me it's like this stuff's just happening and yes is we don't know when the benefits happening and I think that's that's the problem for me is in advertising I think GDPR is just it's a, it's a good effort but it's just not really answering the problem for me the problem is is like I just don't even know where my data is and I don't know when I'm being hoodwinked and therefore the decisions I think I'm making for the better have probably been coerced at some point six months ago two years ago four years ago I don't know but the decision I think is true may not be and I think that's the problem with copious amounts of sharing data leading to a better experience is what if that experience has been made for me because somebody yeah. else wanted me to have it? Sort of following up on that, you sort of mentioned that the advertising agencies specifically are the ones in control of how we target people based on the data that is collected. Do you think that's correct? Do you think that advertising agencies should have that responsibility or do you um, think there should be some kind of regulation around it? I think realistically uh, creative agencies aren't in control of any of that. Um, so. Um, I was speaking to um, Experian the other day. Um, big, they've just been bought, um, so that they're now part of one of the biggest outdoor media people in the UK. Um, and they were saying, well, you know, when you tell the media people what to buy because it's all your strategy, and your strategists have gone off and said it's a mobile campaign, and we want people at bus stops to be playing interactive experiences at bus stops. We go, we don't tell them to do that. We get told the square that we've got to fill. We go, Christ, they bought a big billboard. <laughs> Um, we wanted a game that was personal. Yeah. So um, I, I, I kind of think one of the problems is that we don't really have a huge amount of data. We bought a, um, talking about ad fraud, which is like one of the big things, which is like where's your data going and who's using it for nefarious means, is we have bought a mobile video uh, media platform so that we're giving out the ads and we get the data back and we can see what works and what doesn't. And I think everybody else, especially creative agencies, are just in the dark because um, they don't know what worked, because they're not getting the data, because um, somebody else is using it for their own kind of you know, fiddling. Yeah. Um, so I think we're, we're, to a certain extent, we do have a data company, and we, <laughs> we've got all that as well. Um, but as a, the creative part, the WCRS, Teleads, you know, like Sky and Churchill and all that sort of stuff, we're not really using a huge amount of data at all, and we're not getting any back. So we're just making cool adverts, uh, and, then some <coughs> and, and there's some, quite frankly, dark shit going on in the layer below us um, that we're not aware of, that we don't need to get involved in and we're not involved in. And I think that's, that's sort of a worry because the thing that we do is we, we've, there's a responsibility to be a, a, almost like an art piece as well. You know, that's what advertising should be. It shouldn't just be about flogging stuff yeah. and you buying it. It should be a value exchange. You know, an advert should be a piece of entertainment. And, you know, so I think we're, we're losing that beauty of advertising in the... The data exchange. It's, you know, I'm a techie, you know, so I get I get it both ways. But I think there is there is empathy is missing um, in technology right now. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. Sorry. I think my question kind of comes off the back of that, and it's something that you said about well, we <coughs> sometimes make some mistakes, or there will be some bad things that we'll learn from. And I'm just wondering, is that the right attitude to take? Um, with our kind of personal responsibility of what we can do and what data we can aggregate or what the companies you work with or what you're trying to build for the future being the experts of the time yes this technology is new but you are the experts not the 50 year old people who you say you meet what are you doing within your workplaces or setting guidelines or action plans where you can make sure that there is that line of who you want to work with or where you want to go so this one yeah go for it um I think a lot of it is not being lazy, is the first part of it. It's very easy to just put together a media schedule, use all of the normal names you put it, put something quite broad out there, optimise it on something, and kind of say, yeah, it's good enough. I think, to Dino's point, that creative is a huge issue, within reason, um, because that's the end product that people see. And if you can't deliver something that's on point, then it doesn't matter how good your media is. I think creative needs to take some responsibility within it. Um, we do things like biometric testing, so we'll have uh, facial expression monitoring going on, eye gaze going on, galvanic skin response, measuring the sweat in your skin, and we'll basically test the creative that you're watching, and then the emotion that sits within it. So are you enjoying it? Do you find it disgusting? Is it confusing? And then trying to get a feel for actually when a viewer, which is obviously representative of what the audience is, what is the emotional impact that's going to have on them? And is it something, again, it's that value exchange thing, is it something that's good and worthwhile? 
before we'll actually go and actually buy the media and put it against it. And is that a defined action set? And are you utilising the people that you're advertising to to feed back into them? Yeah, so we'll basically put in a representative sample of what the audience is. So if you've got a 55 plus audience, we'll go get a load of 55 year olds, stick them in our office, rig them up to different wiring and different testing, and then start to see how they react to that content. So the idea again is what we were saying about earlier is that it's got to be contextually relevant to actually start to create the empathy that sits within it. So if you can go to somebody and say, here's a website, which is kind of what we've already done, for example. Um, here are a load of just articles, go look through them. And the idea is that if you don't start to bias somebody with what you want them to do, they'll have a normal experience. But what we're actually doing is we're tracking their eyes. So we're seeing how many ads they clicked on, at what point they start to smile when they're going down the page, which units did they click on, did they go display, did they go native, did they go into something else completely different, was it expandable, did they notice your takeover banner whatsoever of the home page, and then start to then learn back what it is that people actually care about ultimately. And I think if you don't have that level of diligence that sits within it, and there's a matter if you're a creative agency, a media agency, or a brand, if you can't make yourself relevant to the audience, then you're ultimately not going to be here in the next 15, 20 years, because there are lots of people that will make that effort. I think also, I mean, just to <coughs> be a little controversial, I think there's a, there's a, um, a guy who did a demo in an Apple store in New York about three years ago, and he, he programmed the Apple computers in an Apple store to activate the, the webcam when people were on them. And I think the art piece was called some like people staring at computers. Um, and his point was like, do you have a different face when you're looking at a computer? And you literally have a deadpan. So your facial expressions and your emotions are for when you're communicating with people because they're useful. If you're communicating with essentially a wall, you don't use them. So I think there's an interesting bit where we're, I, I, you know, uh, basically he got actually done by the FBI in the end. Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a whole story behind it. It's a really interesting story as well. But you know, his proof was that when you're communicating with a computer, you don't use the whole emotional range. So using that emotional range to justify things can be a flawed science. Um, so you know, if you look at there's a great photo of Serena Williams um, with this grimace on her face, and you would have said she's snapped a ligament that she's just about to go over, and this is terrible. She's like literally just. And when you you pan out, you realise she's just beaten her sister for the first time, and it's just pure joy. And you go, right, a computer would look at those and go, total pain. Right, pain relief is the advert you need. Whereas it's like complete joy, you know, unbridled joy. And that, that's the same photo. So using expressions and face expressions for, you know, too much analytics or putting too much sway on them, I think can also be a bad thing. Because the science is imprecise. Because we have the same face for a lot of stuff. And if you just zero in on the eyes and go, what are those eyes doing? You go, pain. You go, no, it's happy again. You know, so... I think bias is also a big thing. So all those algorithms are written by, well, not all of them. I think a lot of them are written by white guys in California somewhere. So, you know, there, there's a talk about the earlier, we talked the Algorithmic Justice League. You know, look it up. It's a really interesting thing. There's a, a black female coder who has to wear a white porcelain mask when she's doing face coding because the standard face algorithm doesn't work with black tones. No, it's, it's that sort of thing that all, there's a load of data out there we're just using, which is my point, is we're just using it. We don't know to interrogate it because we've not been told to interrogate it. Um, and it's happening in wider culture right now. We're, we're questioning boundaries between things, or at least we're, things we seem as normal we're questioning. We're just not dealing with data and advertising as much as we should. And, and just quickly respond on your point about is it good enough to, you know, I, I think that in innovation, one must fail as well. And I think that it's, I, I'm constantly, that's a bit of my mantra at the moment, is you kind of have to have some of the things that don't work out in order to kind of get on the straight and narrow. And I think um, what we try to do is in our accelerator programs is iron out some of those things in advance by having, you know, trialing, testing, point of proof of concepts. And so hopefully in those safe spaces, you're able to kind of expose some of these things. But when they're on mass scales with really big companies, that's where things start to kind of have mm. mass consequences in terms of tipping points. So you know, we're, we're, we're there to kind of breed that eco ecosystem in this country, but I can't you know, probably say from a global point of view. So There's a great example of um, phone cases. There's a great AI fail, which was the logic was if you make automatic phone case visuals on Amazon for phone, iPhone cases using what the most popular images are right now, you can't fail because the most popular images is the best image in the world, clearly. Uh, and it was what people were searching for right now. And it was things like toe fungus and cocaine and you know, adult diapers and things like that. And of course, all these automatic images of like an iPhone case, buy it now dynamically printed iPhone case with two lines of cocaine on it. It's like, you know, so 
<laughs> you know, yes, that's a fail, but I, I, it's AI is great and everything, but it's by no means anywhere near usable, I think, at the moment for us. And then the counterpoint to that is if you do it well. So, for example, we've got um, a client that is actually a phone case manufacturer, and what they've done is they build out loads of different creative variants of lots of different images, and they do a huge survey and say which ones you prefer, which ones you not prefer. And then the ones that obviously get a lot of likes, they start to feed back into machine learning and learn what it is that people enjoy. And actually what they've done is cut down a lot of waste from creating a lot of phone cases that just go straight into landfill. So they're actually having ecological benefit. So again, it's who controls that tech and what are they doing with it ultimately that can make the difference. So it doesn't matter if it's us in our agencies or you guys in your agencies, ultimately mm. if you're not trying hard enough, then you're probably guilty ultimately. Yeah, I mean, no judgment there, right? Sorry. Another good example. <laughs> no, we, we use uh, there was a good slide that we use, which is called hyper personalized celebrities, and it's it's basically an algorithm that just generates faces on the fly, and they're all believable. Every single it's like that those kind of morphs used to get back in the day in like music videos. It's it's just constantly running, and you could stop it at any point. You go, oh, that's plausible, and it looks like a celebrity because it's been fed celebrities from Hollywood. Yeah. And therefore, it knows what celebrity looks like. It's got the straight nose and the eyebrows and everything, and symmetrical faces. And you can just literally stop at any point, and you can say, like, I want it with a beard and dark hair and whatever it is. It'll go, here's a thousand. Just press stop whenever you want. So if you, to that A-B testing point, if you seem to respond to women with blonde hair and glasses, then great, you know, we can give you as many. That you, you, but you're never aware that you're getting hoodwinked. You just realise after a while, you go, I really like women with blonde hair and glasses, because we've fed you so many of them. So I think there's that sort of... Again, there's some quite interesting things we can do, but we just, they're just not ready yet. So I think there's a lot of hype and then there's a huge amount of reality. And reality is we'll get a media thing that goes, you need to advertise broadband for Sky, and we'll go, you know, lots of people go off and fill bits of paper and then come back and go, here's an idea, yes, great. Data doesn't really come into it until we get a media plan. So I think there's a big, big disconnect with what's possible. And I think that's probably where we worry a bit is because it's going on under here. And we have media agencies in our building. <coughs> we own the media agency. We just don't, we don't <laughs> connect with the advertising agency. So that's an issue. Any more questions? Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you.